Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Andrei. And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand. And thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people. And we smote him until none was left to him remaining. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities. All the region of Argob, the kingdom of Og in Bashan. All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars, beside unwalled towns a great many. And we utterly destroyed them, as we did unto Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city. But all the cattle and the spoil of the cities we took for a prey to ourselves. And we took at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites the land that was on this side Jordan from the river of Arnon unto Mount Hermon, which Hermon the Sidonians call Siron, and the Amorites call it Shinir. All the cities of the plain and all Gilead and all Bashan unto Selka and Andrei, cities of the kingdom of Og in Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. And this land, which we possessed at that time from Aror, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites. And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto half the tribe of Manasseh, and all the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of the giants, Jair, the son of Manasseh took all the country of Argob unto the coast of Geshurai and Maacathai and called them after his own name, Behehavoth Jair, unto this day. And I gave Gilead unto Mekir and unto the Reubenites and unto the Gadites. I gave from Gilead even unto the river Arnon, half the valley and the border even unto the river Jabok, which is the border of the children of Ammon. The plain also in Jordan, and the coast thereof from Chinneroth, even unto the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, under Ashdoth Pisgah eastward. And I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God hath given you this land to possess it. Ye shall pass over armed before your brethren, the children of Israel, all that are meet for the war. But your wives, and your little ones, and your cattle, for I know that ye have much cattle, shall abide in your cities which I have given you, until the Lord have given rest unto your brethren as well as you, and until they also possess the land which the Lord your God hath given them beyond Jordan, and then shall ye, be, then shall ye return every man unto his possession which I have given you. And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. So shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whither thou passest. Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. And I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth? that can do according to thy works and according to thy might. I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes, and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. Get thee up into the top of Pisgah, and lift up thine eyes westward, and northward, and southward, and eastward, and behold it with thine eyes, for thou shalt not go over this Jordan. 
But charge Joshua, and encourage him, and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. So we abode in the valley over against Beth Peor. So here in Deuteronomy chapter 3, first thing you can do is you can keep your finger there and go to Psalm chapter 136. Psalm 136. As you're looking for Psalm 136, let me read for you verse 1. Again, it says, Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to the battle at Indriai. Over in Psalm 136, the Bible reads in verse 1, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. Go down to verse 10. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which divided the great sea into parts, for his mercy endureth forever. And made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And Og, the king of Bashan. For his mercy endureth forever. Here Og and Sion are mentioned in the context of Psalm 136, talking about the great mercy of God and how we ought to give thanks unto him. Give thanks unto the God of gods. Give thanks unto the Lord of lords. Give thanks unto him for his mercy that endureth forever. Mentioned in the context is how Pharaoh was overthrown. Og. Sihon, king of the Amorites, overthrown because of his mercy that endureth together. He calls them famous. He calls them great. And as we read through the scriptures, we're going to find that these kings, especially Pharaoh, Sihon, Og, are mentioned over and over and over. Og, 22 times in the King James Bible. Famous, great. And what's the purpose? What's the point of these kings being brought to remembrance? Well, they were famous. They were well known. And so at the time, these would have been great memories that they had of these kings that were over them. Very easily into their remembrance were brought to prove a point. And what's God's point that he's trying to make? Go to the original mention of Og, king of Bashan. Numbers 21. Numbers 21. This great, this famous king was destroyed. Why? Because God's mercy endureth forever. Numbers chapter 21 and verse 33. It says, And they turned and went up by the way of Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, went out against them, he and all his people, to battle at Andrei. And the Lord said unto Moses, Fear him not, for I have delivered him into thy hand, and all his people and his land. And thou shalt do to him as thou didst, unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So they smote him, and his sons, and all his people, <coughs> until there was none left him alive, and they possessed his land. There's the first mention there of Og, king of the Amorites. God commands, fear him not, I will destroy him. The psalmist says, because God's mercy endureth forever, this would be. Now most frequently, that was the first mention, most frequently Og is mentioned here in Deuteronomy chapter 3. Go back there, Deuteronomy chapter 3. These famous kings, commonly, often, are brought up in the scriptures to prove a point. Deuteronomy chapter 3, I think that proof there 
The point that God is trying to make there is in verse 22. It says, Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. The title of this message in regard to Deuteronomy chapter 3 is, He shall fight for you. He shall fight for you. Fear not, the Lord shall fight for you. Verse 2 it says, And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand. And thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Hezbon. Fear not, why? Because God says, I will deliver him. I will pass him over. I will give him into your hand. We've been ordering delivery a lot lately. Isn't it easy to just put in the order, right? And it just shows up at your door in your hand, right? God's saying, I will deliver him. Fear him not. Perhaps this was a prayer that Moses had made. Oh God, if we're going to have this land, Og needs to go. He put in the order and God says, fear him not. I will deliver him. What's it say in verse 3? So the Lord our God delivered. Isn't it true? God says, I will, and then he does exactly what he promised to do. I will deliver him, verse 3, so the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og, the king of Bashan, and all his people. And we smote him until none was left to him remaining. The Lord delivered, promise made, promise fulfilled, almost without even a, a skipping of a beat there. Same breath, God says, I will deliver him, then he says, I delivered him. And you can see that as an example. Keep your finger there. And I'll go to Deuteronomy 29 real quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 29. And in one verse, and quite often when you hear about these kings, you don't hear a lot of detail about them, but what you do hear about them is this statement or something like it. Deuteronomy chapter 29, and in verse 7, the Bible reads, And when ye came unto this place, Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us unto battle, and we smote them. There's not even, there, there's a comma there. They came, we smote. That's it. They came to battle, we smote them, just like that. There's not a lot of detail needed. There's not a lot of, of, uh, of build-up to a statement like that. Back in verse 3, simply God says, I will deliver, and he delivered. They came, we smote. That's it. He shall fight for you. Why? For his mercy endureth Forever. God shall fight for you. Deuteronomy chapter 3, look at verse 4. Deuteronomy 3, verse 4. And we took all his cities. Now this isn't just like, you know, we won a little battle. This isn't just like, you know, we, 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 you know, we, we took, we took a, a shot at his leg and he was limping for a bit. No, we took it all. Verse 4, and we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities. All the region of Argob, the kingdom of Og in Bashan. We took it all. There wasn't one left. Sixty cities became ours in that moment. They came, we smote. God promised and delivered. Instantaneously, it seems. Verse 5, all these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars. That's those sixty that were mentioned. They were all heavily guarded and fortified, high walls, gates, bars. Besides these unwalled towns, a great many, everything seemingly was stacked against us, carnally, worldly speaking. The walls were high, the gates were strong. And yet God said, I will deliver, and God delivered. They came, we smoked, just like that. Why? Because God shall fight for you, as he promised. Verse 6 says it twice here, and we utterly destroyed them. As we did unto Sihon, king of Heshbon. Look at Sihon's already, one chapter later, a byword. Just like we did to Sihon. We utterly destroyed Og, that famous king. It says, utterly, again, destroying the men, women, and children of every city, all 60 of them, and those little towns to boot. They didn't stand a chance, it says, with that term utterly. We utterly destroyed them. They did not stand a chance. It almost doesn't even indicate God's people breaking a sweat over this. Why? Because God's mercy endureth together. He said he'll fight for you. He said he'll deliver, and he delivered. Just like that. Start to apply this to your own life. 
Think of the challenges that are set before you this day. Think of the hardships. Think of the strong and fortified cities in your life. God's promised us victory over all of our challenges, all of our struggles, all of our hardships, all of our hurts, pains, and sufferings. He promised he's just waiting to deliver because his mercy endureth forever. If you go down to verse 8, it says, And we took at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites the land that was on this side of Jordan from the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon, which Hermon the Sidonians call Siron, and the Amorites call it Shinir. So this was a place of dispute, obviously, because many had laid claim to it. Verse 10 says, All the gates of the plain, and all Gilead, and all Bashan, unto Salca and Endriai, Cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. And to the reader in, in, in back in that day, they would have known these cities very well. They were probably just as famous and well known as the kings that lorded over them. And yet they just were delivered. Verse 11, it says, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. A special group, I believe cursed of God for their wickedness. A special group of men, the Bible says, of renown. Men of great stature, yes, but men indeed. Men that were strong, they were well known, they were famous, these men. And tall, and strong, right? These great men. God promised to deliver, and he delivered. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giant. Look what the Bible says. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? He says, go and look at it. Go to Rabath. Go look at this bedstead. Nine cubits, the Bible says, was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. Nine cubits by four cubits. That's 13 and a half feet by six feet. Now, that doesn't mean he was 13 and a half feet tall, necessarily. Our beds are king-size beds, right? They're about six feet by six feet. When I lay in them, it goes pretty much head-to-toe with a few inches on either side. This one would have been six feet wide, so just like your king-size bed wide, right? The difference was it was twice as long was his bedstead, okay? I don't think he went head to toe on that thing, and he was just squeezing into it, which means Og, king of Bashan, was probably around, if we just compare scales, my bed to his bed and that sort of thing, we look at it, was probably about 13 feet tall. Tallest man mentioned in the Bible, I believe. I'm about six feet, Andre the Giant. He was about seven foot seven or seven foot four inches. We have Robert Wadlow is the tallest man ever recorded in recent history in the Guinness Book of World Records, 1940, eight feet eleven inches, almost nine feet tall. By comparison of biblical times, Goliath, he was six cubits in a span, right? A span being this much, a cubit from here to here, but the cubit of a man, 18 inches, a span just your hand's breadth, about half a cubit. Goliath would have been about nine and a half feet tall. So taller, indeed, than Robert Wadlow, and you can go look him up in the Guinness Book of World Records, see him standing next to a little car, right? He would have been about seven inches taller than him. But not unreasonable, right? Not, not like, not like these, these Jack and the Beanstalk kind of giants where his eyeball is the size of the room or anything. I don't believe in that. But a big man, nonetheless. And, and they, had, they had bred big men over and over and over. And so, so, so but, but being big and being strong, that didn't make them last, did it? Right? He, his, recorded as the last of the remnant of the giants. And I believe that these were a group of people that were such that God wanted them removed at this time. Why do I know that? Because God promised to deliver, and he delivered Og. Og was the last. Og was the remnant. His time was up. We could continue on. Down verse 12 through 17. We've already read that. It talks about all of these places that were given to, like it says at the end of verse 12, the Reubenites and to the Gadites. If you read in verse 18, the Bible says, And I commanded you at that time, saying, this is Moses talking to the people, Gadites in particular, the tribe of Manasseh, half of it, or sorry, Reuben in particular, and Manasseh, a portion. It says, I command you at that time, saying, The Lord your God hath given you this land to possess it. 
Ye shall pass over armed before your brethren, the children of Israel, all that are meat for the war. But your wives and your little ones and your cattle, for I know that ye have much cattle, shall abide in your cities until I have given you, until the Lord have given rest unto your brethren as well as you. And until they also possess the land which the Lord your God hath given them beyond Jordan, and then shall you return every man into his possession, which I have given you. He just keeps saying over and over and over, I've given you, I've given you, I've given you. And the interesting thing about it is that God is giving them something that they asked for. Here's an answer of prayer. To find the original story, we can go back to Numbers chapter 32, just a few pages, Numbers 32. Okay? We're talking here about Gad and Reuben. Numbers chapter 32, and in verse 1, it says, Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that, behold, the place was a place for cattle, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest, and unto the places of, or the princes of the congregation, saying, Adaroth, and Dibon, and Jazer, and Nimrah, and Hezbon, and Eliela, and Shebam, and Nebo, and Beon. Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle. And thy servants have cattle. See how they're like connecting the dots here. This is a land for cattle, and if you look, we got much. We got many cattle. Verse 5, it says, Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight... Let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over Jordan. Now, I think this might have irked Moses a little bit, because at that time, he had already heard promise and word that he would not be seeing the promised land that he desired. He had just marched around 40 years, missing out on the promised land that he had desired. Uh, Joshua, as well as um, Caleb, had also marched around an extra 40 years because of the sins of the people, having desired that promised land. And yet, here is a group of people that they have much cattle, and they say, this is a good land. The difference is, and the problem is, it's not the promised land. Nevertheless, they go and they say, God, I know you're promising us that, but could we have this instead? And they go to Moses, the man of God, about it. Verse 6, we'll continue reading. It says, And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Israel, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. Referring back to, remember last week, when they went up to spy the land and to check it out. And they came back with that evil report that, yeah, the land is great, but the giants are big and strong and the cities are fortified. We can't go over into that thing. And Moses is here thinking, I am livid. I just brought a people for 40 years onto the basic border of this land. They, for fear, have turned away from it. And I marched another 40 years through this land. Waiting to enter into the promised land with you, and now you're going to say, no, we don't want it? Are you kidding me? Moses is like, I'm going to be marching another 40 years here. Because these people are doubting. Their faith is, what is going on? And so he comes at them. He says, you're doing just like your fathers did. Moses is livid. He thinks it's going to be another 40 years of wandering. But look what happens. Go down to verse 16. No, sorry, read 14 first. Verse 14, it says, And behold, ye are risen up in your father's stead, an increase of sinful men, to augment yet the fierce anger of the Lord toward Israel. For if ye turn away from after him, he will yet again leave them in the wilderness, and ye shall destroy all this people. Now, this is a much greater multitude than just the dozens or so spies that went in. But we saw how much trouble a dozen spies did when they went in, doubted, and came back. These are now not doubting, but they're thinking about their flocks and their possessions. And man, this land is beautiful. This is great for them. So Moses is, is confounded by this all. But if you read down in verse 16, it says, And they came near unto him and said, Look, look what they're saying. They're, they're going to reason with him now. Okay? He's probably red in the face, angry with them. They say, we will build sheepfolds here for our cattle and cities for our little ones. But we 
ourselves will go ready armed before the children of Israel until we have brought them unto their place. And our little ones shall dwell in the fenced cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return unto our houses. The children of Israel, until the children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. For we will not inherit with them on yonder side, Jordan, or forward, because our inheritance is fallen to us on this side, Jordan, eastward. Moses said unto them, he's thinking, I don't know how long he thought for, but he says, if ye will do this thing, if ye will go armed before the Lord to war, and will go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord until he hath driven out his enemies from before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward ye shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. This gives us a little bit of a picture of how God works. God promised the land, and yet the people said, oh, this land is, is good. It's, it's fitting. It's, it's, it's well for us. Okay? So God, and the man of God, hear the reasoning. We want this, but we understand there's a war there for our people. We understand there's a battle out there for our people. We will go with them. We will support them. We will strengthen them until the promised land is completely theirs. Then we shall return unto this thing. And he thinks, and though God promised one thing, they wanted another. What oh, God's faithful to do? He gives them what they wanted. If they keep the commandment, if they keep what was intended, if they go into the promised land as was desired of him, he says, certainly, you'll be guiltless. The man of God does. But if you don't, you have sinned. And I like this. I love this verse. It's a famous one. And be sure, verse 23, be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. We can't run from sin. We can't make promises and not keep them. We can't, we can't set ourselves to do according to the will of God and not follow through. Be sure your sin will find you out. You preach messages upon messages upon that. But that's, that's just a good verse. Just remember that. Be sure your sin will find you out. Not beating up on anybody, of course. Going back to Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 21. So Moses says, that's fine. You can have this land if you follow us into the promise and help your brethren out. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 21, it says, And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. So shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whither thou passest. You shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. He says, Joshua, to Joshua, ye have been through this. You have been through some things. You have seen some things. You have, you have taken this journey with all these people. You know all that has been done unto those kings that stood against you came out. They were destroyed, as I promised. Ye know all that has been done in the past, so shall the Lord do for you. And today, we all stand on that same promise. You have those same stories. You have seen all that God did unto Og, to Sinai, to Pharaoh of Egypt. You've seen all that God has done to the people that stand against the work of God, stand against God's people. You've seen these things. We stand on these same promises then that are made to men like Joshua here at this time. We stand on those same promises by the same faith that he stands on. That's good. That's well. And even in our personal lives, we all stand on experiences just like he's referring to as Joshua. He's referring to Joshua about. He says, all of the things that you have experienced to this day, you're standing on the shoulders of them. So sometimes when we're going through struggles and hard times, we're like, oh man, this is, this is terrible. 
But some of these things are brought into our lives, whether it's loss of loved ones, loss of health, loss of, loss of financial support, loss of, loss of whatever, when you're suffering, when you're struggling, right? Those are just stepping stones so that God can take you as he is to Joshua. Thine eyes have seen what I did to those kings, to your struggles, to your challenges, to your, to your difficulties, to your sins. You've seen what I've done to what was coming against you in your walk and hurting you and harming you. You've seen what I've done. I will, he says, do it again. Do the same thing unto all the kingdoms, all the challenges, all the struggles that are before you. It's one of these moments of reflection for Joshua. Think of all the things that have happened. We've read about two and a half chapters now. And it just encompasses a whole history of a nation of people. What do we see? We see the plagues of Egypt. We see the crossing of the Red Sea. We see the destruction of Pharaoh's army afterward. We see the, the water that gushed out of a rock in the middle of a desert. We see manna coming down from heaven. We see, we see a people of millions being led by fire and smoke to their destination. There's famines, perils, swords, hardnesses, right? All of these things. He said, look at all the things that have happened and you've been through, Joshua. Look forward. I will carry you through these things all the same. All those kingdoms, whether you're passing over to, shall be just like Og, just like Sihon, just like Pharaoh. Don't fear them. Why? The Lord shall fight for you. It's the Lord that's going to fight this battle. It's the Lord that's going to carry you through. It's the Lord that's going to strengthen you. It's the Lord that has your enemy's days numbered. Og, Sihon, famous kings, Pharaoh... You remember those guys, right? Right? They're just stories of old history. What's in front of you will be destroyed all the same. He's promising now to Joshua. I believe we can, by faith, stand in these same promises. And look at our lives in, in reflection and say, man, I have been through a lot. I have struggled through a lot. And you know what? It makes you the man. It makes you the woman that you are today to go through some things. And I believe in this world, there is nothing more powerful than a battle-hardened Christian soldier. A Christian who's been through some things. Who's overcome some things. A Christian that has, has been kicked, has been beaten, has been drugged through the mud, has been lied about, has been cheated, has been robbed, has been manipulated, has been, has been hurt, and has come through and overcome all of these adversities, and is now, here's a key, looking forward by faith to what's next. There is nothing more powerful than that. A Christian who has been hardened and prepared as a good soldier for what's ahead, and they're approaching it by faith. And where's the faith of Joshua here? Upon God. As God says, don't fear them, I will fight for you. He's promising the same promise that he made when he said, I will deliver them, and he delivered them. They came out against us, and we destroyed them. In the same breath, God fulfills his promise unto his people. We need to take advantage, I believe, of the times that we are going through some things and learn something as we're going through, especially some of us that are a little bit younger. Vince, you're going to go through some things in your life, right? But as you go through things, just remember it's preparing you for the challenges that are ahead. I wouldn't be able to face some of the challenges I'm in right now without having overcome things of the past. Marriages can't survive problems now if they haven't been through some problems before. Right? To overcome and be, be married for 40 years in this life, you had to get through that first fight. <laughs> Sometimes it's on the honeymoon. Sometimes it's before that. Right, But you get through these struggles because it's going to get you to a final destination. The destination is where God has you, where God wants you to go. The promised land for these. But remember, always remember, it's the Lord that will fight for you. Now, does this mean, again... When God is saying to Joshua, hey, you've seen all that has happened, I will fight for you. Don't fear, nothing to fear here. Does that mean we're never going to get hurt? We're never going to suffer? We're never going to bleed? We're never going to struggle? No. When we go through all those things, we get knocked down, we get hurt, right? 
It's hard. It's challenging sometimes. God fighting for you doesn't mean that you're never going to strike your foot against the stone. Right? It doesn't mean you're never going to dash that foot, right? Just because God's angels there are protecting you, it doesn't mean you're never going to get, get dinged, get hurt, get, get, you know, go through. But God's fighting for you is simply promising the promised land, the destination, the final. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. You can keep your finger in Deuteronomy. Hebrews chapter 12. I love this. You barely need to preach this passage of Scripture. It's actually Hebrews 11. God fighting for you. That means we'll never... It won't even be hard. Not even a sweat on your brow, right? See, we read the passage of Scripture where he just says, I will deliver and he delivered. Right? They came out and we smote them. And it's just like a comma in the middle there. A few little words. A breath. Not even a breath. That sounds easy. God's fighting for you. Piece of cake, right? Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 34. Verse 33 says, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. This sounds good. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. God, aren't you fighting for these people? Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Wasn't God fighting for these people? Of course he was. He promised, I shall fight for you. Verse 39, and all these, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. What's happening here? God is fighting for you. But he doesn't exclude you from battles and from front lines. He also doesn't exclude you from the fact that you may not get to your desired end, to the promise that you would expect. God fighting for you means that he finishes the race. He is the final destination. You are in his hands, as is pictured here back in Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3. Joshua just finished hearing, Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. This is what Moses is saying. God will fight for you, Joshua. And then he turns to the Lord, Moses does, in verse 23, And I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, remember this is on the heels of Moses going out for 40 years and wandering about trying to get this promised land having it fall away from him because of the lapse in faith of another, having people that were raised up, innocent of that great transgression, who followed him into and at the doorstep of the promised land, dropping these famous kings to the dirt. The same Moses heard them say, we don't want to go in the promised land, we want this land. And he's like, all I want is the promised land. It's all I want is that promise. I've been waiting for this promise for so many years. Moses besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? Look at that position of faith that Moses is saying, that statement of faith. He says, Lord, you have begun to show your servant, to show me your greatness and your mighty hand. You have just begun to show me what you can do. And he knew he could do more. He knew a promise remained. And he says, God, I believe that there is something more for me. I believe that there is something over that Jordan. The promise. 
God, you've only begun to show me. Listen, today, God's only begun to show you what he can do for you and in your life. The promise is waiting for you. God's only begun to show himself great and to show himself mighty in your life. Believe that by faith. He says, for what God is there in heaven and earth that can do according to your works and according to your might? God, you can do great, exceedingly abundant above all that I can even think and fathom and imagine, God. Verse 25, it says, I pray thee, I pray thee, I ask thee, God, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, the goodly mountain of Lebanon. God, let me have the promise. God, I've waited so long. God, I want that promise. God, I believe that there's more for me. Is the Lord fighting Moses' battle? Is he fighting for him now? I believe, yes, he is. But he says in verse 26, And the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes, and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee. Speak no more unto me of this matter. Moses must have been crushed. He'd heard it before, but now he's, he's on the doorstep. He says, God, God, just let me see it. Let me have the promise. God promised some greater thing for him. I believe even as it says in Hebrews. The Lord promised some greater thing that's only fulfilled in those that come after. It was fulfilled in the one that came after, wasn't it? Moses' promise, what he wanted so bad, what he believed God to receive, it was not fulfilled in his life. Because God says, no. Nope. Let it suffice thee, speak no more. I have something for you. Look, verse 27. Get thee up into the top of Pisgah, and lift up thine eyes westward, and northward, and southward, and eastward. Behold it with thine eyes, for thou shalt not go over to this Jordan. So many of the promises in our life we only experience by faith. That's, that's this. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith, these were all brought great things, had God fighting for them in their lives, and yet they suffered such and then did not receive of the promise in the end. Hoping for, expecting for, asking for, praying for, just trusting God to deliver as he promised them. He said, I will deliver, and he delivered Sihon, didn't he? Moses saw it with his eyes. Moses even proclaimed in the, in the life of Joshua, who would follow after him, that God has shown you all of these things. These famous kings were destroyed so that you could see, so that you could believe, so that you could not fear, and that you could go with God that will fight for you. He's like, but I wanted that. God says, you can see it. It transcends faith. He, he had it realized in his life. He saw it, he just never experienced it, right? God brought him to a point where he transcended. He went past faith, right? And he saw the promise. Went past faith, he saw the promise. God has something better for them, seeing the promise, having it realized in Moses, who is a type of the Old Testament, only to transition to Joshua, symbolizing the New Testament that carries them into the promise. Right? Moses still sees it. Moses still has it. Moses still receives that possession. But he only receives it through the one to come after. He says, get thee up and look. And then he says, but charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him. For he shall go over before this people. And he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. You don't have to believe anymore, Moses. You'll see the promise. But go up to Pisgah, and Moses never came back from Pisgah. Why? Because he went on to the heavenly Jerusalem. I don't think it bothers him now. He wanted, he wanted that temporal Jerusalem so bad. He wanted that promise in this life so bad. And yet God says, no, you can't have it. But here, come up, send Joshua. Send, the New Testament renders him as Jesus, right? Jesus will give you and show your people the way into the promised land, right? He says, Moses, you can't have it. Here, you can see it, and what's waiting for you is even greater. There is some better thing available to those. And look what happened to those. Son of son. Right? 
Some received their dead, raised to life. That must have been joyful, but they died. There was cruel mockings. There was beating. There was temptations. There was, there was famines, pestilences, suffering, suffering, suffering. But their promise was fulfilled in that Joshua stepped in and went into the promised land. And you'll find as the Bible brings him into remembrance, looking back to these times, it, 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 it's confusing maybe because it always says Jesus, Jesus. The New Testament rendering of Joshua of the Old is Jesus, is Jesus, is Jesus. And look, the Old Testament will never fulfill the promise. You will never enter into the promised land through the law, through Moses. But God brought him to where he could see it, fulfilled it in the one who was able to cross over Jordan. Our Jesus, our Christ, went sinless into Jordan, crossed it, and entered into the promised land and brought many with him. God was still fighting for them throughout it. Their end doesn't always seem so pleasant. It doesn't always seem right. But look, Moses is not angry with God now. He looked for a temporal promise and a temporal land. All the while forgetting that there is a city that hath foundations, that's builder and maker is God. And that was the promise that he encountered when he went up and looked at what he thought he wanted and encountered Christ. And entered into the promise in heavenly Jerusalem. I love a chapter like this. There's so much to it. But ultimately I believe what God is trying to teach us through Deuteronomy chapter 3 is that he will deliver you. Moses is not upset today. He was delivered. God fought for him. Do you know how God fought for him? Jesus Christ came. Fulfilled the promise that was made before the foundation of the world. And dying upon the cross so that Moses' faith in God when he said to him, God, you've only begun to show me what you want to do for me. You've only begun to show me your great and mighty works, your hand, your greatness. I'm trusting you, Lord. God brought him up and took him to heaven, but said, look, look, there goes Joshua to fulfill what I want him to do so that you can join me in the real promised land, heaven. Thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done to these two kings. You can probably think in your recent, you know, past, just two things, two kings, two two." Things that were just standing in your way, coming against you. You've seen what the Lord your God hath done to these two kings. So shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whether thou passest. Thou shalt not fear them. Don't fear the future. Don't fear what's to come. Why? For the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. He's got it planned out. He knows the end. Just trust him. Follow after him. Be like Moses. You've only begun to show your servant what's to come, your mighty hand, your greatness. I pray thee, let me go over and just wait for God to say, yeah, okay, go over. Or, I got something better. God always knows what's best. Amen.